But yeah, we're going to talk about cultivating a life of greater pursuits. We're going to talk about three pursuits tonight that we should engage in as Christians that will change our lives. Want to hear about that? Good. If not, you came to the wrong place. All right. Anyhow, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. So take a walk with me in your Bible so you'll know where these books are. Unless you're one of these techies, then go on your phone or whatever it is that you do. Your iPad. I don't like that. Even when I'm in an airplane, I don't even like a Kindle. I like a book. It's just me. I tried a Kindle, couldn't get into it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. All right, we're going to begin at verse 15. And uh, Paul was Timothy's father in the faith. And Paul was instructing Timothy in a very strong way. Okay. Uh, in a very strong way as to what to do, what not to do, what to refrain from, but what to pursue with his whole heart. And not only for his own life, but uh, as the leader in that community, then Timothy was supposed to take that, these truths and, and kind of dole them out and teach them to people that were, he was discipling. All right, so here we go. 2 Timothy 2, beginning at verse 15. This is the first aspect, aspect of instruction that he's given to him in this passage. He said, be diligent. I know the King James uses the word study. Well, study is a part of it in terms of actually studying, but it's, it's broader than just studying the Scriptures. Here's what he means. He says, be diligent in every facet of your life, including Bible study, to do what? To present yourself approved to God. Now, how many of you know that you can know a bunch of scriptures and not be approved to God? Your life can still be out of whack and you can know the Bible. You don't believe me? You haven't pastored. All right, now. Because that's what most of our counseling is about, people that know the Bible but aren't living it. And so that's what counsel is to help them to kind of turn that and say, this is how you apply it and this is why you have to apply it. And this is why you're not getting the results that you want, because you're not doing it God's way. I know it's real deep stuff, but it really trips people up in a big, big way. Here we go. He said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. All right, now what, what is the imagery here? He said, a worker or a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Why would you need to be ashamed? Because you're not being diligent. You're being slack. You're being sloppy. You're not living the way you should. You're living a double life, a secret life, doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, that's going to come back to kind of haunt you, so to speak, right? So he said, we don't want to be ashamed. And we don't want to give place for the enemy of our souls to accuse us, because he's the accuser. Now he said, part of what we do, not only in our study and our speaking and our witnessing or in our preaching, but in our living, we want to rightly divide the word of truth. We want to rightly interpret it, we want to rightly apply it, and we want to rightly or correctly live it. Now, verse 16. He goes into verse 16 and he says, But shun profane and idle babblings. In other words, arguments, disputes, uh, you know, conjecture, speculation, debates for the wrong reasons. He said, get away from that stuff. He said, because these things will lead to more ungodliness in your life. And get away from old wives' fables, get away from religiosity, and stick with God's word. And he said, because this kind of out-of-whack message will spread like a cancer. And then he lists two, two people's names in verse 17 that were doing that exact thing, spreading unsound doctrine. He said, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. Notice that at one point in time, they knew the truth. But what's happened to them now? They strayed from it. Now, sometimes people will stray from it because they cop a bad attitude. Some people will stray from it because someone steps on their toe and they get offended. Offenses are the most caustic, deadly thing, virus, in the body of Christ. Offenses. People are offended every day of the week. They live offended. The whole world is offended. The whole church is offended. Whoever's not offended tonight, you'll be offended tomorrow. <laughs> Someone doesn't look at you the right way, stroke you the right way. Everyone's offended. 
Why? Because the spirit of this age and the spirit of our culture is you have the right to be offended. One of my favorite movies of all time is Dumb and Dumber. And, uh, and I love it. There's a scene in a diner. <laughs> yeah, the first one. So there's a scene in the diner where uh, Jim Carrey goes up to the counter and there's a typical waitress, you know, she's a cashier at the diner and she's reading a book, kind of like, huh, what do you want? Anyhow, and uh, you could see the camera zooms in real quickly on the book that she's reading and here's what it is, of course you're angry. <laughs> I said, isn't that fitting? And look at her. She looked like she wanted to kill Jim Carrey coming up to the counter. And, uh, and you, know, you have to see the rest of the scene. <laughs> Has something to do with a salt shaker. All right, no. But everyone's angry. Everyone's offended. Everyone's ready to be offended. Everyone is being told from the time they're born, you have the right to be offended. You exist, therefore the world owes you a living. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. That couldn't be farther from the scriptures. You know what the scripture says? If a person doesn't work, they ought not to eat. Now granted, that's if somebody could and they're choosing not to. We're not talking about people that are disabled or other situations where someone needs help because that's part of good, what good government should do. I said good government, not insane government. <clears throat> so he said, get away from stuff that's going to drag you. So these guys knew the truth and they strayed from it. And there's a million reasons why people stray from the truth. People can do the wrong thing, they can get offended, they can make wrong choices, they can get into shame and guilt and remorse, and instead of repenting, they run away from the Lord and from the body of Christ. All that will do is cost you big time, because the decisions that you make when you're away from the Lord, you're going to have to live with once you get your head back together. You're going to have to live with the consequence, maybe not condemnation, but consequences for sure. Well, God doesn't condemn you. That's right, but he won't alleviate the consequences of foolish decision-making. And so these two guys here, who knows why they knew the truth and strayed from it, and now they're legends in their own mind in that they set up ministries and they're teaching unsound doctrine. And they're leading people astray and into ungodliness. Matter of fact, if you read the epistle of Jude, which we won't do tonight, but it's that little tiny book just before the book of Revelation, um, here's what Jude says. Jude basically said this in a paraphrased way. I sat down to talk about issues common to our salvation. In other words, general instruction. And, and then I felt the Holy Spirit say, no, I want you to zoom in on a cancer that's infected the body of Christ. And here's what Jude said in that case, in their case, was the particular cancer. People taking grace out of context, living, teaching people that it's all right to live in sin because it's all grace anyhow. Without the justice of God and God being a just God, a holy God and a righteous God. Taking the concept of grace and making it the truth instead of a truth or an aspect of what God provides. And he said that was a cancer in whatever group that was that Jude was presiding over. And he said it was a terrible thing. They were taking the grace of God and treading it underfoot by calling everything grace and, and, and uh, actually promoting ungodly lifestyles and sexual sin. Unbelievable. Twisting and distorting the scriptures, Peter says, to your own destruction. So anyhow, these guys here were in this boat. Now look over to verse 19. He said, nevertheless, knuckleheads notwithstanding, the solid foundation of God stands. The kingdom of God will stand. Having this seal on its foundation, here's what it is. The Lord knows those that are his. But then there's a second quote, if you will, emblazoned into that foundational stone. Here's what it is. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you name his name, you better live his name. 
or you're going to get yourself in a world of hurt. Verse 20, and here's what he goes on to say. He said, because the great danger is knowing the word but not doing it. James says, in fact, in James 1, that there's a built-in deception that goes with equating having heard the word with having applied it. There's a great deception in that. And a lot of that, it's a religious hangover. If you grew up religious, there's a big hangover. You know, like you hang over if you drink booze and you get a hungover the next day. Oh. Well, so part of the religious hangover is a performance-based Christianity. Or, I can do this and this and this and this, because after all, I can always repent tomorrow. Look, repentance is not yours to play with. And forgiveness is not yours to command. It's up to the Lord whether or not he gives it. I can always repent tomorrow. Are you out of your mind? What if tomorrow never comes for you? Then what? <clears throat> now he says in verse 20, but in a great house, here we go. In a great house, let's say the kingdom of God or any local church, we can contextualize it on a multitude of levels. He said, in any great house or any singular house, uh, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but there are also vessels of wood and clay that you can conceivably find in that place. And he said, as for that uh, former group, they're vessels of honor. As for the latter group, they might be in the house, but they're not, they can't be used in an honorable way by the Lord. Verse 21, so he says, so what's the solution then for someone to move from being a vessel of dishonor into being a vessel of honor? To be a vessel of wood or clay, which is really fleshly living, into a vessel of gold and silver, which is what? Sanctified, consecrated living. How do we make this transition? Verse 21, if anyone cleanses, cleanses himself from the latter, well, what's the latter? Living a dishonorable life living in dishonor. He said, if you'll cleanse yourself from living in a dishonorable way, you'll become a vessel of honor. It's all about obedience. You know what Jesus said if, in John 12 or John 14? He said, if you obey me, if you love me, rather, obey my commandments. If you love me, just do my word. It's not really complicated. Understanding it. It's tough for doing it, but it's not complicated to understand. He said, you've got, your love has to have a demonstration. It had, there has to come a place where your love is demonstrated. But what did James say? Faith without what? Works is dead. Somebody can say, well, you know, I'll show you my life by my faith. And the other one says, well, I'll show you my faith by how it plays out in real life and works. Works have something to do with Christianity, not in terms of salvation, but in terms of a fruit of our life. So he says, if you cleanse yourself from living inappropriately, whatever that might look like, you'll become a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Isn't that a wonderful place to be? You know, like he polishes you up, man. You're a, you're a, a beautiful vessel of gold, and he polishes you up, and he puts you front and center. And then when guests come into this big house, this big castle, when top-level guests come in, he said, oh, 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 he tells the servants, no, get that, get that vessel of gold right in front. I just polished it up. Let me tell you what that life used to look like. But I'm so proud of that one. I took my time. I polished him. I polished him. I buffed him, you know. And here they are, a vessel of honor. No, use that vessel. He said, we're prepared for every good work. Now, verse 22 We'll stop at this verse. He says, flee also youthful lust. What are youthful, youthful lusts? That means things of the flesh that come from a place of immaturity, come from a place of worldliness. He said, flee from those things. You see the imagery there? Did he say, play with it? Did he say, walk away from it? He said, run. But listen to me. He didn't say, just run away. You can't become Amish and get holy. Being Amish doesn't make you holy. 
It can make you look strange, but it doesn't make you holy. Now, some people lift the Amish up as though there's some holy group. Let me tell you, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on within the Amish community. But secondly, how can you say we're the holiest thing going when by your very life you are violating in spades the Great Commission, the last thing Jesus said to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples, and make a difference. No, we're going to have this cloistered community build walls and fortresses and moats around with alligators and dare you to come in. That's the Great Commission at work. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Why do you think the same concept with monasticism invaded the Catholic Church? Years and years, centuries ago. Well, the only way for us to be holy and truly devoted to the Lord is let's seclude ourselves on a mountaintop in the middle of nowhere and not even talk and kneel on rice just in case we need it. Give ourselves a good beating just in case we need it at some point in the future. That's not holiness. You know why? Because you don't find that in the scriptures. If you want some, something defined, let the Lord define it, not men. That doesn't make you holy. It makes you secluded. What makes us holy is when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in the real world, inside, from the inside, out, not the outside in. Am I pointing the finger at every single person in those groups and say there's, there's not one righteous and no, none of them are good and they don't mean well? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying the movement, the concept, the structure of both of those movements is completely contrary to Scripture. And anything that's built contrary to Scripture can never bring forth the fruit of Scripture that Jesus would want. Never. Hello? I mean, am I, am I talking to the right group tonight? I think you live in the real world, don't you? How many of you had jobs? How many of you at least had a job in the past? Well, I'm saying, maybe some of you are retired now. All right, you, you've had one, you have one. How many of you are going to have one? <laughs> All things equal. <laughs> well, guess what? Every day that you've gone there, that you go there, or that you will go there, you're living in the real world. Now, how many of you ever gotten the opportunity to share the gospel in your workplace? Maybe one-on-one -on -one with somebody? Guess what? You're making a difference right there where people live. You're not secluding yourself in a castle somewhere and saying, Hey, you, come up! Come up! This is the only holy place. Come up or you're never going to get it. No. What did Jesus do? He came down to us. What do we need to do? We need to come to where people are and draw them in. With God's love. Be different because you are different. Live differently because you have a different spirit on the inside of you. And people need the Holy Spirit more than anything else in this world. People are demolished nowadays. They're just demolished. Confused and hopeless and upside down and inside out and families coming unglued, falling apart. Everything is unhinged. Everything. You look at the Middle East, every single nation there is at war. Every single one. I mean, this, I've never seen anything like it. Never. We live in fearful times. And they're about to get a little bit more interesting. So, you got a front row seat. Now's not the time to be playing head games. Get all the way in or get all the way out. But I would encourage you, get all the way in with Jesus tonight. Because you, when this, all thing, when this whole thing comes down, you don't want to be the only dance partner, a dancer, dancer without a partner. Now, he says, flee youthful lust, all right? So let's get this image. Uh, you know, stuff that you used to do, that you know, that now that you know the scriptures, you say, that's really not good. You run that way. But lo notice the imagery here. He said, flee youthful lust, but pursue. Notice, he doesn't stop by saying, flee. Because then you become Amish. No, 
He said, yeah, flee that, but pursue something greater with the same intensity. In that flight, in that pursuit, I should say, is where the answer comes. It doesn't come by the flight. It comes by the pursuit. Thank you, all two of you. Now, he said, pursue what? Righteousness. You see it up here? Read it with me. Righteousness. Faith. <laughs> Love. And peace. All by yourself. Because after all, you don't need the church. You could be a Christian alone. That's not what it says? Oh. So the Reader's Digest was wrong. Yeah. We're supposed to call on the Lord with those out of a pure heart. You see, who you hang with has a major, major influence on what you'll become and how you think, how, what your value system is, who you hang out, who you hang out with. And so I want you to get picture this imagery here. He said, run away from stuff that you used to do, but don't let that be the end of the equation here because then you just get religious or legalistic. No, you've got to run away from that, but run to him. The same degree of your flight has to be the same degree of your pursuit. If I'm running away from that, but I'm, if I'm filling my life with the same level of pursuit and acquiring and apprehending him, then I'm going to apprehend his love and his goodness and his righteousness and the transformation in my life, and I'm going to do it with, with a company of people that want the same thing. You understand that if you want to go all the way with Jesus passionately, do you understand that not everyone that you might, you know, have a coffee with in the fellowship hall wants that same thing? I'm just telling you the truth. Not every Christian wants the same thing. I guarantee you every Christian wants heaven, but not every Christian, Christian wants a passionate, all-in, reckless, abandoned, promoted pursuit. It's not going to happen. I had to face that years and years and years ago when I was a young Christian, and it blew my mind. How could you be a lukewarm Christian? Why would anyone want to do that? Why would you want to leave whatever it is you came out of to come into something equally as dead but only own a Bible? Being the major difference maker. I, I never got that. I could never get that. You know, we left what we were, grew up in, and we dove all the way in. You know what? Like a diving board. Boink! That's it. You understand, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You've got to get all the way in. <laughs> Not that I know, but, but I've seen it. I've seen it in action. All right, no. <laughs> but you have to deal with that. So you, you got to run with those of a pure heart. Did he say people that are perfect? No, or nobody be running. But people have to have the same intention that you're going to run with, have to have the same intention. We're going all the way. Now, some of you are old enough to remember this song. What's the name of the song? Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not that old then. Uh, no. Uh, um, <laughs> no turning back. How many of you are old enough to remember that? Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. Etc. And several other verses. Very simple charismatic chorus, but it was very meaningful for a lot of people for a long time. And it really spoke to a lot of people coming out of religiosity and having been hammered and persecuted and mocked and belittled for, you know, being these born-again, nut-job Christian, that, that was a major, major song back in its day. And sure enough, I mean, the heartbeat of the song is no turning back. And number one. And number two, one of those verses says, though none go with me. That's tough. That's tough. Because sometimes you have to give up some old friends 
you have to give up some old drinking buddies, some old drug friends, some old whatever friends. You got to give up some relationships that aren't good for you. Because Jesus said, unless you have all of me, you have none of me. And there's an aspect of self-denial that has to go with. I mean, how else, do we, how else do we think that he's required to give us this heaven place? Everybody believes heaven is this glorious, unbelievable place. Well, then why should he give it to us? Why, why should he give it to us? If we're not even going to do the basic thing of what he says, this is what gets you there. Nah, I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't, then don't agree with it. But then on that basis, if it's written and you say you don't agree with it, so therefore you're not going to do it, why should he still let you in? That's just idiocy. It's better never to have known than know it and argue about it. That's just insanity. So, what are these greater pursuits? Ready for three of them? <laughs> Three pursuits that can make a difference and will make a difference, not only in our lives, but in those around us, which is also what the Lord wants. Ready? Number one. First thing that we want, well, is the pursuit of hope. The pursuit of hope. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 42. The pursuit of hope. Is it cool in here or is it me? How many of you all, you're Okay. How many of you are cool? Yeah, you're cool, all right. No, no, I'm just joking with you. Says you, all right, no. <laughs> Ushers, Mark, keep your eye on just, okay? Want anybody to just be sitting there the whole time like that? That chattering of teeth gets my, distracts me, no. <laughs> The pursuit of hope. That's the first thing we want to pursue in this life. Hope. Because how many of you know that in Christ we have a living hope? We have a living hope. But sometimes knowing that it's there and apprehending it and feeling it is a different story. Especially when you're in a real tough place. Listen, you know, we have this thing called hope. We have it in Christ. You know what the rest of the world, you know how they define hope? Or what the word is that they use as a substitute word? conceptually optimism because I want you to think about hope if someone doesn't know Christ what are they hoping against they're hoping against all hope they're just hoping it works out why because they don't have any rational basis upon which to stand and say I believe this situation is still filled with hope now we say that because we say because he's still in control no matter what you see so we have a basis for hope if I don't have a basis for hope, then I'm just hoping it all works out. But I don't really have a basis for that belief other than, well, let me try and stay optimistic. Now, it's an interesting word, optimism. We're going to kind of dissect it in a second because you'll see where it's coming from when we apply it even as believers. Now, uh, in a sense, it's the same thing, but in a sense, it's very different in that the object of our hope is him and not just, I hope the situation works. Now, now, both of those concepts, optimism and hope, are, are future-based concepts in the sense we're hopeful or we're optimistic about what the future could hold con uh, conceivably. Uh, now, there's a lot of pessimism in this world. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uncertainties as never before. But in Christ, we have a living hope. You know what? Jesus said in John 16, that in this world, there'll be tremendous tribulation. In this world, it would be tremendous tribulation. That word tri tribulation means intense pressure. It's, it gives a word picture of a child, what a child feels coming through the birth canal, ready to be birthed out into this world. Tremendous stress, pressure, contractions and convulsions and you know, tremendous movement before something is released. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes that's the way life feels. How many have ever been in a season of your life where it feels like every thing is going wrong for a while. Yeah. Everything's going wrong for a while. Well, let me tell you, everything, to everything there's a season. That will stop and then everything will start to go right. Now let me tell you, in between the winter and that spring, what, what is key 
is seeking the Lord as to what he wants you to learn in that birth canal. Because there's always lessons that he's after. There's always impartation of truth and wisdom that he's after in that birth canal. If you don't get it, get ready for round two. It's inevitable. It's absolutely inevitable. Because he is intent on one thing, according to Romans 8, that we are going to be conformed to the image of the Son. Period. That's the only thing in Scripture that we're predestined to. So a lot of people hung up on predestination. We want to get, we're predestined to that. We're predestined to the sausage grinder. You're predestined to the crucible, to the refiner's fire. Predestined to be conformed to the image of the sun. But that's where it gets better. That's where it gets better. You know what? You know what the interesting thing about change is that when the Lord changes us, he always will stop us, kind of tap us on the shoulder and say, look back now. Now, listen, he says, I want you to look back and I want you to see what is no longer dogging you. I want you to see what I've actually caused to fall off of you. And the whole time you might have thought, I'm just making your life miserable. The whole time, what's going wrong? Why me? Why not you? <laughs> and the whole time he said, no. You understand what I've carved away from you without telling you is something that you've been trying to get rid of your whole life and couldn't do it. And I've added something to you that you never otherwise could have apprehended. But listen, this life doesn't come with an instruction manual when you're in the meat grinder. This is the, this is the instructional manual they have, but it doesn't mean that every circumstance of life is going to come with a set of explanations. No, we've got to rely on a set of promises. Forget about the explanations. That'll all come in heaven. But can you cope with living by promises? See, the more analytical you are, the more answers you want because you want your ducks in a row, your underwear folded a certain way and fluffed, your socks color coordinated, or you'd freak out. <clears throat> well, listen, if that's you, get ready. The Lord's going to blow your drawers up. Which drawers did I mean, though? <laughs> Why? Because he doesn't want you to be relying on that stuff. You understand that if you, if you think, I want to go from A to B to C to D, where's the life of faith there? That's not faith. That's a linear progression. That's like she's getting on the highway, and I want to go from exit 4 to exit 7. There's no faith in there. There's a lot of presumption, and there's a lot of self-will. I make the plans, and I want God to kind of come into collusion with me on those. No, he said, no, 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 I make the plans. I'm waiting for you to come around. I'm the senior partner. You're the junior partner. <laughs> now, Psalm 42. You guys having a good time? I'm just trying to explain what's happening to you. <laughs> All right, now, he says in verse 1, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my, pants soul for, my soul pants for you. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I got two translations. <laughs> Somebody's pants. I don't know. Who's not. They're not mine. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff about pants tonight. No. And drawers. No. See, pants and pants, pants, lots of pants. No. He said, as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. But now look at what he starts in anguish. He said, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food both day and night, while they continually say to me in a mocking way, where's your God now? Yeah, where's your God now? Now what? Uh, but that's not, a proper, that's not a proper way to look at it. But when you're, when you're in a tough spot, the enemy's always going to cause someone to say something like that. Right. Now, and I want to just jump to verse 5. Because in David's case, you can see the explanation is here in verse 4. 
where he's saying, boy, I used to go with the throngs praising the Lord to Jerusalem for the great, the great feast of Israel, and now my whole life is thrown upside down, and people that I used to trust are stabbing me in the back, and I'm being hunted down like an animal. What happened to my life? What happened to this future and hope I heard about? But now he goes into verse 5, right? Here's what he says. Why are you cast down on my soul? All right, can you imagine David? He's, he's kneeling down, and now he's saying, wait a minute. My thoughts are rambling like, a, like an 18-wheeler rolling down the highway. Stop! Let me, let me just think clearly for one second. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why? Has God moved? No, he may feel as though he did, but did he really move? No, he said he would never move. I'm in covenant with him. I, I, I've been anointed when I was a teenager. I was anointed to be king. It doesn't matter what's happening now. God never breaks his promise. And I don't know what weird path I'm on, but he will keep his word. So do I really have a justifiable reason to be in this pits of depression? He said, no! Here's what I'm going to do. I don't have the explanations, but I do have this in my control. I will hope in God. I will choose to put my hope in God. For I know I shall yet praise him again. For the help of his countenance that will come my way. In other words, he'll turn his face my way. Cause the light of his countenance to shine upon me. And he will be my glory and the lifter of my head. I don't care what I feel like tonight. I'm going to look for a hope filled tomorrow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we need hope. And we need to be giving people hope. Now, let's dissect that word optimism just for a second. You know, the word optimism is really formed by two original words. And that first word, the first the prefix is the word opt, O-P-T. You know when somebody opts out of a texting group? <laughs> I don't know, because I never get in the group in the first place, but... I've heard it said, I, I opt out. That means you choose, right? You choose to not be in. You opt out. And just like opting out, we can also opt in because hope is a choice. Hope is something the Lord has and who he is, but we've got to choose to tap into that. We can opt out or we can opt in when it comes to that. Now, we can either say this, why has God left me? Or we can change the statement and say, I don't understand this, but I know this much. God is in the midst even of negative things. And as long as he's there, I will fear no evil. His rod and staff will comfort me. And I will go through that valley and come out on the other side. Now, I want you to picture the word optimism. You know some related words from the root word there is the word optometry. Optometrist. And things like this. So you know when you really wrap the definitions around, um, uh, together rather, and you've kind of patched them together from the original languages, here's what it's saying. I will choose, hope means this, because I am choosing to see. Right? When you go to an optometrist, what are you doing? You're getting your sight checked. Right? Your eyes are out of whack, you need them straightened out. Maybe a two-by-four will get them straight. I don't know what it'll take, but you go to an optometrist. And so when we put these words together, really the essence of hope lies in the fact that we choose to see God in the midst of the chaos instead of simply seeing the chaos and letting our sight stop there. It is a choice to see something greater. It is tough but it will work. Listen, it is tough. It's the toughest thing you're going to do is pull yourself off the floor. When you're down on that floor, when you're weeping, when you're confused, when everything's coming down around you, when you're fearful, you're scared about something. But I'll tell you what, when you pull yourself off that floor, you're going to see it will work. He will meet us in that pain. Amen. He will meet us, doubts, and fears notwithstanding. Martin Luther King said this, we must accept finite disappointment 
but we must never lose infinite hope. Robert Schuller, the late Robert Schuller now, said this, let your hopes, never your hurts, shape your future. How many of you know that your hopes, your hurts are the ones that want to scream most loudly to shape your future? Never trust anybody again. Never trust anybody, for example, if you've been hurt. But what that, what's that's going to do? It's going to pollute your well, cause you to walk with a chip on your shoulder, and will sabotage all every good relationship that even may come your way. Because you're not seeing things clearly. You haven't processed through former pain. And one person, Orson Marsden, said this, There is no medicine like hope. No incentive so great and no tonic so powerful as expectation of something that tomorrow holds. Isn't that beautiful? So let me ask you a question. When you hold up a mirror in front of you, what reflection do you see? Do you see a reflection of hope or being hopeful? Or optimistic? Or do you see a reflection of something else? Only stuff that's been behind you. Or do you see something that the Lord holds up ahead of you? Amen. To be hopeful, truly hopeful, is to choose to see Jesus in everything that we go through. Now listen, why is this so important? Well, it's important for our mental health. It's important for our spiritual well-being. It's important for the nurturing of our faith. But listen, last, it is important... Because every one of us as believers have a mandate within the greater word of God to be what? Dealers in hope to a hopeless world. If we never go through anything, how will we ever relate to people that are? If we've never come through anything, then we have no platform to speak to people that are in it currently. If we have no hope abounding in us, then all we do is commiserate on our common failures without any talk of victory. That doesn't do anybody any good. So when somebody asks you, how are you doing today? This has happened to me on a number of occasions. I ask someone, how are you doing? And they say like this. They almost cop an attitude. How am I doing? Yeah. You talking to me? Yeah, no. Yeah. No, here's what they say. You really want to know? I say, oh, you want to play this game? No. <laughs> then that blows their minds. How can a pastor say no? Well, because of that smart aleck answer you just gave me. Don't make me pay for Someone that you wanted to cry on their shoulder and they didn't want to hear about it. You're going to make me pay for what they did to you, right or wrong? Huh, you really want to know? No, I don't. Honestly, no. Because with that attitude, all you'll do is take up all my time and refute all the answers I give you. You don't want answers, you want to whine. Get your 15 minutes of fame sometimes. See, we know why? Because the person is not in a place of hope at all. They're in a place of bitterness. And I can't purify a bitter well. Only the Lord can. Now, if that person changes their tune, man, I'll be right there. Go ahead. You have 60 seconds. Tell me. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking with you. <laughs> well, we understand it's serious stuff. Um, you know, there's a beautiful scripture in Proverbs. It says when a... You know, uh, that when our spirit is strong... We can even be sustained through times of sickness, through times of brokenness, through times of tremendous pain, 
through times and experiences that would otherwise be hopeless. The condition of our spirit on the inside is critical. It is key in that picture. Because when we're strong on the inside, we're going to be seeing things differently on the outside. And even if we struggle, we're going to be sustained. But the Bible says, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? That when our spirit is wounded, when our spirit is broken, everything collapses from the outside in. But when our spirit is strong, we can go through a lot of stuff and still maintain hope and still maintain forward movement instead of just being on the ground and staying there. We're all going to be on the ground, but staying there is a different story. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord says he made us right there. Now, we have a couple more things, but we're going to have time to cover them now. We're, going to, we're just going to stop there. I have two more, two more pursuits I want to get to. But I think we had a good time mining this out tonight, and I just don't want to blow through it. But I'll close with this last verse. Proverbs 18 and verse 10. It says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Guess where a tower is, guys? It's up on top. The name of the Lord is like a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are what? Safe. Run to him tonight. Run to him in your deepest pain. Run to him in your deepest fear. Run to him in that deepest nightmare. I'm going to tell you, we got to rely on the fact he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. It doesn't matter what comes your way. I'm the one who sticks closer than a brother, and nothing will change my mind about you. Isn't that beautiful? All right, come on, let's stand together.